Our next speaker, Jamie, is my favorite fish geneticist because he has, in fact, in recent year, last year or two, given me several straight answers. So an unusual fish geneticist, Jamie. <coughs> is, is this on? Oh, it is, yeah. <coughs> the, thank you for um, describing me as a, a fish geneticist. As I keep pointing out, um, and I had this debate with Ted last week, I'm an ecologist that uses genetic techniques, and I'm nothing to be scared of. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today um, is a few uh, examples that I hope will uh, illustrate this, uh, this question and, and some of the work that has been done in my uh, lab in Exeter um, uh, to try and sort of get a handle on this question. Stocking is a, mis a means of restoring salmon populations. How effective is it? So what I'm going to show you is uh, examples that have been carried out where, with research with the Environment Agency, um, with the West, West Country Rivers Trust, uh, the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, and the Atlantic Salmon Trust, and there will probably be others that I've forgotten and I will mention as I go along. So I'm going to take you through uh, a study that looks at natural recolonisation of the Thames, uh, natural recolonisation of the Mersey. I'll touch very briefly on some work that we did with uh, Ronald Campbell on the Tweed. It's very, only very preliminary. I'll, I'll talk to you about a long-term impact of supportive breeding on the dart. Um, and as the title of my talk uh, contained the word Clyde, I thought I should at least uh, comment on that. I don't know where that came from, actually. I can't remember whether I put that down or... Anyway, that, that's not all my work. That's, a, that's part of the Solsi, uh, the Solsi work. Now, that, that comes out really through um, work led by uh, Eric and uh, John Gilby and, um, and the whole uh, Solsi genetics group. So I thought I would just uh, show you this, not that I need to, to, to convince or, or uh, educate any of you guys on this, um, but it's worth remembering that the reason that this is... Um, important to us is, well, from, some, from a perspective of an ecologist who uses genetic techniques, it's important because this process drives the, the um, drives in river, those in-river signatures which we use as geneticists to be able to uh, uh, recognise differentiation between populations and to be able to use in applied research for assignment, for instance, of at-sea uh, caught salmonids back to a population of origin. So it's this important homing to a river that drives um, that, that, that drives that differentiation uh, between stocks. And what we can see is when that homing to a river breaks down, um, so that differentiation between stocks uh, breaks down. And there are a few studies starting to come out on that now, and there's some nice work from, from Spain, for instance, that illustrates that. So it's important to recognise that this... What, what defines salmonid, that that's kind of archetypal anadromous behaviour, is also absolutely key in, in maintaining uh, this genetic diversity which we're able to make use of in, uh, for, for studying the biology and in management purposes. So why stock? Um, my answer isn't as long as uh, David's answer, um, but um, you know, it's, I think it's equally good. Um, increased fisheries or mitigation... Uh, that, that's, the, that's the two sort of basic categories. So what happens uh, to fish that, that we stock? Well, they may persist, um, they may displace native fish, they may interbreed with native fish, um, or they may not persist. Um, and I know from working with uh, many of the stakeholders in this room uh, that um, time is often limited, uh, effort is, is limited, um, and money is most definitely limited. So really we don't want to be wasting any of those three resources. So the first example I'll give you, and we'll address, we'll address those uh, specific points there in a, in a very worked example towards the end of the talk. The first example I'm going to give you is this example of uh, natural uh, salmon recolonisation on the River Thames. Uh, so once uh, a, a very productive uh, river, um, lots of uh, interesting facts to be known about... Um, you know, fish could be taken out and, and fed, as I think it was, to David said, to apprentices. Um, and I remember hearing a very interesting talk by Ronald Campbell about a similar sort of thing on the Tweed at one stage. But anyway, I digress. And this is all published, and it, you can download it for free, um, if, if you want to, uh, from, from my website at least. Um, natural recolonisation on the Thames. So this is work carried out in conjunction with the Environment Agency, 
And the good news is the Environment Agency come out as the good guys, and I'll show you that at the end. Um, so, number of fish stopped. This was a long-running program. Uh, fish put into the River Thames uh, in all, uh, in all sort of three major life stages that we might consider stocking, uh, various points within the river, uh, fry, um, par, particularly in the early years, uh, and uh, smolt later on. And this uh, continued up to around 2010. And if you see um, these data, they reflect... Uh, you, you, know, you, you don't have to be a, a statistician to notice that this kind of hump here corresponds to this hump here, and when this tails off, this tails off. So fish caught, fish by, by that I mean salmon, caught in the River Thames uh, mirror very precisely um, those uh, fish that are being stocked into uh, the Thames. Money was tight, I'm told, and many of these fish um, that were stocked into the Thames uh, came from uh, the Shannon and the Delphi, um, and my understanding, uh, although David, David knows a little bit more about the details of some of this, uh, the early materials, but certainly from working with my co-author, uh, Daryl Clifton Day at the Environment Agency, a lot of this uh, later stuff, they weren't even um, the best fish from the Shannon and Delphi. Those were being used uh, in those catchments. These, these were sort of seconds. Um, so, you know, it, it's a... It's a it, it's tough, all right? Um, and you can see it, it tails off when this tails off, and I've already said that. So what did we do? We worked with the, uh, the team at the Environment Agency, and we looked at a small sample, a small sample, but it, it's, this isn't an issue of sample size. This is pretty much all that was coming back between this time. And we looked at 10 tagged fish, and these were fish that had had a fin clip taken, so we could, uh, we could know that those were uh, hatchery uh, stocked fish, and 16 untagged adults that were caught uh, during this, this period. And these were caught largely at uh, Molesbury and Sunbury. Uh, uh, Molesbury and Sunbury, there you go, around here. And what was the outcome? Where had these fish come from, um, the, the tagged fish and the untagged fish? And, um, well, before I tell you where they came from, because that's the punchline, I'll just refer you uh, to this. This is, a, this is a map of coverage of uh, uh, natal populations, uh, in-river populations. So these are genetic, genetic profiles calculated for all of these populations um, in uh, UK, Ireland, France, and Spain. And this work was a, a baseline, a, a, sort of, a sort of four a forerunner to the Solsi project. And this work was extended quite considerably within the Solsi project. Um, so this is a, a big uh, early uh, collaboration between ourselves and um, the team of uh, Tom Cross and Phil McGinnity uh, in Rye in France and the laboratory of um, Eva Garcia Vasquez in Oviedo in Asturias in Spain. And we used this to be able to say, where are these 16 or indeed these 10 coming from? And the strength of it, as I say, is the baseline. And I think that's a plug really for... For, you know, if we want to know something about at-sea movement uh, or, or using this in an applied sense, these baselines and the Solsi one, as I say, is much more comprehensive or absolutely invaluable. And what we found was that the fish that were, um, the tagged fish, were indeed, uh, they assigned back to Ireland. And so that, that confirms that what we knew, that they were, they were fish that originated in um, uh, the, uh, the Irish rivers, and we knew those to be the Shannon and the Delphi. But the untagged fish, the 16 untagged fish, were coming from this region here. Uh, they assigned the adults, those adults entering the Thames, assigned to these rivers here. And these are the um, chalk streams of southern England. And so what we think is happening is that the Thames, despite all that massive uh, stocking effort with those uh, exogenous fish, those Irish fish, the fish that were finally, uh, numerically at least, in the, in the ascendancy entering the river were not from the Irish rivers at all, but were from these uh, chalk streams. And the good thing about this baseline, I won't show you those details, but you can read it in the, the paper that sets out the ASAP study, and you'll see it again in forthcoming Solsi papers. What you'll see is that um, these rivers here, these chalk streams of southern England, are really quite unique. And they're unique not just uh, within England, but they're unique within Europe. They really stand out as being very uh, distinctive. And I suspect there's a whole lot of uh, local adaptations um, with, sorry, within those uh, rivers. Um, 
that, that kind of pre, uh, predisposed them to being able to succeed in the Thames, which is, after all, uh, if a drop of rain falls uh, somewhere on the Wiltshire Downs, one way it will enter the Hampshire Avon, you go the other way, it'll roll down the, the, the chalk hills of northern Wiltshire, uh, and it'll roll into the Thames. And so the Thames is really, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of underlying geology in the Thames because it covers a huge area, but certainly parts of it are classic chalk stream habitat. So that's what I think is happening there. Uh, press coverage, uh, well, the, the BBC covered this, and as they say, quite rightly, healthy Thames is the key for return of salmon. And I think that's one of the sort of take-home messages. There'll be a couple more. I haven't finished just yet. Um, uh, healthy Thames is the key for returning salmon. You know, you get the river right, you restore the conditions, and you restore the access. In this case, it was primarily restoration of access, uh, and, and those fish return. We don't yet know whether they're breeding successfully. Um, of course, the, uh, the London Evening Standard wanted something a little bit more, so millions wasted on Thames salmon stock. And if you go on and read this, um, you know, the, the poor old EA gets, a, gets the boot put in there. But, you know, credit where credit's due, um, this, this project originated uh, out of a, a conversation be between myself and Daryl, um, and policy has, has changed on that basis. So, you know, millions wasted on salmon stock, but that was the overriding... Um, directive at that time. So people are acting on best practice, but, but as knowledge accumulates, best practice changes. Similar example from the Mersey, this is a river that was, not, to our knowledge, never underwent an active stocking programme. Again, it's published. This is available op open access. Uh, and this work, before I forget, is funded by uh, the West Country Rivers Trust, uh, the uh, Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, uh, and the Atlantic Salmon Trust. And the lead author on this, Charles Akediyashi, uh, is, is, uh, is a, has got, as it, as it were, a, a, a research fellow uh, sponsored by the AST. Ken was very keen that, that, we, that we start to build these links. So, uh, recolonisation on the Mersey. Again, we're using a, a subset here of this baseline, and this is the uh, section of the Salty baseline, so this is some of our data and some of the data provided by other genetic groups within the Salty project. Uh, and John Gilby very kindly made this available for us. There's all sorts of calibration exercises that we've had to go through to make the data sets cross-talk. Um, we analysed 138 adults uh, re-entering the Mersey uh, and a couple of juveniles, so there is active uh, regrowth uh, of, of fish within the catchment. And uh, what we were able to show um, was that, that these, of these 138 that were entering the Mersey, um, that predominantly, and we analyse these with a, 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 a variety of numerical approaches, what we're able to show is that they're coming from these uh, rivers up here. And perhaps the surprising thing was that despite having the D right on the doorstep of the Mersey, there were surprisingly few fish from the D and more westerly uh, rivers. So colonisation was, uh, was not equal based on proximity. And we believe that the um, clockwise uh, gyre within the eastern uh, Irish Sea probably had uh, quite a big impact on that. But I think, again, the take-home message from this study is that if we get the river conditions right, and above, the, above Liverpool, where I, where I did my degree in the 80s, uh, and you could actually sit in a th on a three-piece uh, sofa, a three-piece suite, on the beach at Ainsdale, I remember, uh, just letting the condoms wash around your feet. Um, you know, that river really was shit. Um, <laughs> but... But if you look at the Mersey Restoration Project, you will see that that river is, is possibly one of the greatest turnarounds in river health and river quality that, that, we've, that we're probably going to see in Britain. Uh, and if they can get through Liverpool um, and, they, and they can get up there into, into these areas up here, there's some fantastic habitat. Um, and I think that's a, ri a river where natural recolonisation uh, you know, really is going to uh, sort of... It is going to be the, the dominant force. Uh, a quick example from the Tweed, because I'm conscious of time. Uh, this is a very prelim study that we did, um, that we did for, for Ronald. And what we were able to show was that this, uh, this trib, the Gala Water here, which, which uh, the weir was destroyed, uh, and after 127 years, uh, it was recolonized. And what we see is um, that, keep your eye on the purple bit and the yellow bit, the etric and the cadden, most of the fish were coming from uh, proximal, uh, uh, they're coming from uh, proximal tributaries to the Gala. So again, it's a, a great example of get the conditions right, remove uh, barriers to river access, and the fish will do the rest. 
And I'll finish uh, with, this, um, with this study, which requires a little bit more detail. Um, and it's an example of uh, restocking on the River Dart. So very, very briefly, a classic kind of decline of salmon over time within a river. And you could pick that graph out for virtually anybody, uh, any catchment you, you, you care to, 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 to look at. So a student of mine, Anna Finnegan, who was also a student with Eric, uh, very good now, works for marine management organisation, uh, what she did initially was looked at, at stocking within the dart, and there was a lot more of it than we thought. And in particular, there'd been a lot of stocking from the Tweed, the Tay, and the Elidar in Iceland during the 1960s. Um, but there was very little information on the long-term fate of these fish. So we undertook some genetic analysis to, to see what had happened with these fish. Uh, again, this is, this is published in FME, if, if, and you can get a hold of that. So what was the long-term uh, contribution of these fish from the Tweed, the Tay, that were stocked, as I say, in their hundreds of thousands, and the Elidar in Iceland, to this little catchment, uh, quite a big catchment by our standards, but down here uh, in the southwest of England? Well, each population as I'm sure you know now from, from, from the discussions we've had about the genetic approaches, uh, has a unique identity, and we've used this to, we use this to trace what happened. But before I just show you what happened, let's have a look at the possible outcomes. There are three possible outcomes, and I alluded to these in that very first slide. <clears throat> Perhaps the stock fish will outcompete and displace the natives. Perhaps the native fish will outcompete and displace the stocked. Or perhaps there'll be some kind of interbreeding and the creation of hybrids. Well, let's have a look at what happened. What we found was um, that the Scottish and, Isla Scottish and Icelandic fish genotype, um, we saw, and I should just add that these aren't contemporary uh, um, samples that we've typed. What we did was we worked with uh, the lab at Montrose and another lab in Iceland, and we obtained scales from the 1960s around the time that these fish were stocked into uh, the, our Devon River. And what we found was between about 2.9% ancestry from Scotland, one point, between 1% and 5%, depending on the uh, population within the river, from Iceland. So I think what we, we're looking at is definitely we can rule out that this idea that the, um, the uh, immigrants will, uh, will outswamp the, the natives. We can largely rule out uh, this idea that there's been a complete balance of, of hybridisation. There's been a little element of it, um, but, but not a great deal. So largely what's happened over those uh, 40 to 50 years is that the native fish have prospered. And um, Ken alluded to it slightly. All of these fish will be fish that have recolonised. So they're, they're, all, they're all related to some degree. And if we account for what we might expect as shared common ancestry between these fish anyway, due to, the, due to their um, relatedness post-glacially, um, we, can, we can virtually rule out any uh, long-term uh, influence of, of Iceland and perhaps only a small influence of Scotland in contemporary populations uh, in Devon. So I think the, the take-home message there is that ultimately the river... Uh, and the fish, the native fish, with all those local adaptations, and that's something that Eric touched on, and I think it's something that we're only just beginning to scratch the surface on, those, um, those are the fish that predominate, and the stocked fish uh, disappear. Now, you might argue, well, there's no, there's no harm in stocking then, because they get purged out anyway. But I would say that was the wrong message, because it all takes time, effort, and money. And there's also those other local... Uh, those local imbalances that are brought about by stocking and, and Phil's paper alludes to, to some of that. Finally, I just sort of uh, finish by saying about this issue of um, can stocking activity um, or hatchery activity, I should say, perhaps more, more appropriately, affect the global genetic diversity of salmon? And for this, I'm really just going to dip into the Salsi project. That's the ASAP project, um, and we were able to type a lot of fish there. In the Salsi project, we were able to take that a lot further, populations going right away from Russia uh, and my lab only contributed a small fraction of this and there are other people in this room that did all this. But what we see is this baseline, this genetic baseline and you'll have seen this before because we use this for the Mersey and this is, this is the bit where I mentioned the Clyde as I say um, this is really just a, only in passing but I think it's worth noting these samples here are Norwegian samples um, and at least some of these rivers are those which have been the basis of many of the stocks that are used for uh, hatchery rearing in this day and age. And 
I want you all just to take the last bit of time that I don't have left um, to look where the other bit of yellow is, because I think it's quite appropriate given where we are on the banks of this fantastic uh, river here. It's, it's, it should be a, yeah, it's there. All right, so either there's a lot of Norwegians way off course that are successfully breeding in the Clyde, or there is introgression from uh, other Norwegian fish, probably hatchery fish, uh, that have become established. We don't know what the longevity of that signature is. We don't know what the impact of that is. But obviously, they're there, or those, those genes are there, those alleles are there. Um, what, what the importance of that is remains to be explored. But I think, you know, it's a warning that natural populations are being degraded by introgression from uh, Norwegian fish, probably of hatchery origin. And with that, I'll leave you with this question. What do we want in our rivers? And at the risk of upsetting people, um, you know, we're part of a broad spectrum of what people want in their rivers. Um, and thank you very much. <laughs>